Welcome back. Hopefully you've listened to more than one episode of the Coffee with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Stafford. And today I have with me, Millie, is it Christman or Crispin? Christman. As like Christmas. As cr- Christmas, but with two ends. <laughs> Perfect. As a coach, Millie exists to help people make the changes they want to see in themselves so that they can ultimately pivot their lives with confidence, power, and poise. Her practice focuses on identifying strengths and leveraging them to result in desired change. It's positivity-based, very grounded in today's reality, and that's what makes it achievable. Shoot for the reach for the stars, feet on the ground. I love it. Millie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invite, Kevin. I'm look, looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, this is fun. Just as a, as a quick bit of context, obviously, most people will be listening to this in the early parts of the new year. We're recording this in that, that weirdest week of the year between Christmas and New Year's. I've been, I've, I find that I've got so many people interested in doing podcast episodes this week just to record them because everyone's still kind of got their, you know, they've got their eye on the, on the prize. They've got like at least one hand on the steering wheel, so to speak. Everybody's in their office kind of like taking care of stuff, cleaning house. And I've had some of the best conversations I've had all year. So, you know, no, no, no pressure or anything. <laughs> but I, I'm so happy you're here and I'm really looking forward to this. So let me, let me get started with the start. How did you get into coaching? What was, what was your, your origin story? What brought you into a coaching practice? Oh, well, it's an accidental, an accidental finding of passion. I've been coaching since about 2006, 2007, right around that time frame, And I wound up doing some public speaking here and there. And and there's typically somebody in the audience who always wants to connect to you or something that you say or did resonates with them, or they they just have some special, unique sense of of connection with your message. And and a couple of folks um, came up to me and they just seemed very different. And I've wound up starting to coach them. And I've actually, I have, I still have both of them um, in my client repertoire. If you can imagine, that's how long that goes. That goes back to two clients. That's unusual. Co- coaching uh, engagements uh, really rarely ever last that long. Hmm. But along the way, I just got so many different calls from folks. Hey, so and so wants to cha- make a change in their professional life. Can you help? So and so needs help with looking at their resume. So and so hasn't interviewed in 13 years and doesn't know what they're doing. So after getting these calls and helping folks um, for free, of course and really enjoying it and loving when they get back to me with, oh, look, I got this job. This is what I'm doing. I'm so excited. Um, Realizing how much of a lift I got emotionally from that and how much fun I had. When I left corporate America a year ago, I thought, you know, I'm actually going to do this, uh, but I'm going to monetize it and I'm going to turn it into a business. And so I've been doing it a long time, but this is, I really started monetizing it about a year ago. So that's a, that's the, that's really the, the origin. It was fairly organic. That's, that's exciting. It's, it's, I love how the, the, the themes, like the foundation of the, of like a, a coach's origin story is very, usually very similar. It's basically like they just had a passion for it, found that they were good at it. And then people kept like either coming to them for advice or guidance or like transitional guidance. And then people kept telling them, it's like, oh, you should, you should do this. Or don't you, aren't you already doing this for a living? And that transition can be so difficult sometimes when of not only discovering what, you know, what moves you, what you're passionate about, but then finding a way to do that for a living, which is a tricky phrase, isn't it? When we say for a living, usually we mean for money, but monetizing your passion in a way, it can, it can, it can be very tricky and some people can, can get lost along the way. And I find it very personally inspirational that so many coaches like yourself navigated that journey well and like any good coach, like any good human being want to share what they learned, you know? to kind of go back and be like, oh, this is totally possible. You can be passionate. You can love what you do and also, you know, make a good living at it, so to speak. You know, I love that. Yeah. And, and it was, it was a little bit, there was a lot of fear, I think, that prevented me from doing this earlier. Cause mm. you're, you're right. People did say, why don't you do this for a living? And I, I heard that ad nauseum, frankly. And <laughs> finally, I just decided to go ahead and do it. And, but I, you know, I, I'm a pretty cautious person by nature. So I had to make sure that, you know, A, I was financially able to experience what startup businesses do for the first in my head, you know, three years. That's sort of my, my time frame. Why? I don't know. That's just a comfortable number for me. 
So I found myself in that position. And then I had to figure out a, a bit of a business plan and how I was going to get clients other than them dropping from the sky into my lap, which had been my previous strategic pipeline <laughs> um, way of finding folks. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a tough one. The, the referral, the reliant, the referral plateau, I like to think of it as, because basically once you, re you reach a certain point after a while where you've essentially like people who know of you or like friends of friends or colleagues of colleagues, you've kind of saturated that circle. And a lot of coaches will stop there and have perfectly, you know, satisfactory coaching practices for them, for what their goals are. But it could be so hard to break through that, re that referral wall and get outside of your initial sphere and really, you know, get a, get a different pipelines going and really ramp up your business. It could be, it could be a real challenge, but it's also kind of an exciting challenge too, I think. <laughs> it might be the optimist in me talking. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that is a huge, getting that steady pipeline is really huge because, Typically, the core of being a good coach doesn't have much to do with business development. It, it sort of it sort of does, but but it's more business development for other people. Yes. You're not necessarily working on your own pipeline because you become obsessed with the opportunities for that other person, and you go sort of narrow and deep into these people's lives while you're engaged with them. So your own pipeline can suffer. It, it's, a, it's a definite watch out um, if this is going to be the way that you, you, you choose to earn, earn a living. It's something that to, you've got to take into consideration to figure out how to mitigate around that. Yeah. Do you end up, it, it, it could be a challenge for a lot of different types of businesses, but especially I feel like for coaching, it's like you got into a coaching business so that you could do coaching, but then you also have to like create and run the business. And sometimes that balance can get a little bit wobbly and get a little off where you feel like you end up spending so much of your time just trying to get the business up and running and keep it going, which of course is necessary. But when that time gets out of balance, all of a sudden you find yourself engaged in a business that you love what the business does, but you don't get to do it as much. And that could be like, that, that's, that's a, that could be a trap that is, you're very, yeah. very, very, very to be mindful of that. You know, I, I was concerned about falling into that trap. And so what, what I did to mitigate against that was upon discovery that I was going to now have to be a content writer, a marketer, a CFO, and all these other hats. I mean, I huge amounts of hats that you got to wear. I started a bit of an informal bartering business. So I, I looked at my network with folks that were good at things that didn't necessarily come natural to me and built a, a bit of an informal knowledge exchange relationship. And as a result, I've got folks in my repertoire that are phenomenal strategic narrative builders, marketers, phenomenal strategists that help me. And in turn, I help them around continually honing and refining what it is about what they do that makes them successful and makes them unique and makes them different through the executive coaching piece. And so that has worked out for me. That's, that's been a savior. Well, a piece of advice I would give to folks thinking about jumping into this is even if you're a solopreneur, don't feel like you have to go it alone. There's a huge community out there of folks, myself included, willing to support and, and help. And, and let me tell you, there's enough business out there for all of us. Nobody, nobody has to just, you know, hog the whole turkey dinner. There is enough for everybody. And if you don't have that mindset, I suggest that you not go into this business or change the mindset immediately. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very astute observation. It's, there's a, there's a, there's a not tendency, but a temptation to fall into a scarcity mindset and bring that scarcity mindset into something like coaching. Coaching is about abundance. There's just, there's so much opportunity for everyone to coach and to be coached. And there's such a, a virtuous cycle within the coaching community. It really is. It, it's a big part of the reason why I, I love being a part of like the, the general, like the broader coaching community, because it is just so, what's the, what's the analogy? A rising tide raises all boats. Yes. Yes. I, I find that to be as true in coaching as in any other aspect of life I've ever encountered. I love it. Mm -hmm. We've already, we've been brushing up against it here, but let's, let's talk specifically about your coaching practice. We've talked a little bit about what makes it, what might differentiate it, what makes it unique, but what would you say is what's your, what's the, what's your favorite, what's the favorite part of your coaching practice? What's the aspect of your coaching practice that you enjoy the most that you feel like really sets you apart 
from other coaches, just e- maybe in your sphere or even outside your sphere. Or that's, I, li- I like either what differentiates you or maybe even better, what you, what you enjoy or love the most. One produces the other. So what, what, I, what differentiates me will wind up producing what I enjoy the most. So what differentiates me, I think, is the approach I take is a bit of a, I call it a balanced scorecard approach. It's that part of corporate America, which I can't sh- seem to shake, <laughs> but um, make sure that I give equal attention to uh, the health of somebody's uh, basic pillars that make up who they are, their mental, their spiritual, their physical, all those things together become part of their professional image and their professional brand. So we talk uh, quite a bit about health, both physical and mental. And, and we have protocols around those. And they're just as important disciplines as they are job search or brand create, or personal brand creation, or how do you change careers? How do you pivot mid, mid-career or, or what I call rear career? You know, at the end of your career, you decide, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do this with the last part of my career. Yay. So, you know, my, my approach is, is quite holistic and um, it can be invasive for some. We talk, we, we, go, we go there, we go a lot of different places. So chemistry is important and having good fits important. But what I enjoy the most is that sort of aha moment when the client starts talking about themselves differently mm-hmm. and almost the vocabulary changes and they almost feel like they've gotten taller and I'm thinking, wow, okay, we've just elevated. We just pushed the button and they are now at the penthouse. <laughs> and that always lifts me up. And I, I just absolutely love it. And that's the feeling that I now realize I felt all those years ago when I was motivating some of these folks that would just fall into my lap. I, I always felt so good after we would together enjoy some sort of an accomplishment and I thought, wow, and wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great to get paid for doing this? Oh no, that could never happen. Forget it. <laughs> and on with, on with corporate America, I went. And so now I'm back to that and I'm realizing, wow, that, that is the stuff that really did float my boat and put wind in my sails all those years. And, and here I am now getting, getting to do it. And I, we just got a new client this week. So I'm excited to start with, with him and, and he's a, he's a career pivot. So he's got a great position currently now, but is just stagnating and wants and needs a real change. So I'm, I'm really excited to be working with uh, someone in that situation right now too. That's a really, a really potent word to describe where so many people are at pre-coaching is, is stagnation. Stag- mm-hmm. um, and, you know, or just to put it even more simply, just stuck. They feel stuck. And that's just, that's, a, that's an insidious feeling. And it could really, even like you can have, so much of the apparent earmarks of success and happiness where you have like the job that you at least think you're supposed to have that looks good to others. You, you have a healthy, happy family. You've got relationships and friends. Maybe you have a nice house if that matters to you. Maybe you live in a nice area or just a nice pl- part of the country or the world. But there's just that feeling that you can't shake, that just things aren't, things aren't growing. They're stagnant. They're stuck. They're stale. And that can, that can infect every other good thing in your life. And so being able to be vulnerable enough. And like you said, you go there because you need to go there um, mm-hmm. to be vulnerable enough to engage in that kind of relationship with a coach to help you transition out of a place of stagnancy and into something that is moving and growing. And it, could, it can be, and often is very scary, but that, that fear turns very quickly into excitement. Once you get a taste of what you can feel like moving through your life and still be just as successful, more successful than you previously were, you just continue to grow and advance and also feel that growth and advancement. It's just, it's, I could gush about it all day, but it really is something kind of magical. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It a hundred percent is. And I think a lot of folks that uh, engage with coaches don't quite realize that there's a fine line between professional coaching and personal coaching. And mm-hmm. you do cross a lot of lines because, you know, people use the old cliche of bringing your whole self to work, which very few people really can do, yeah. but your whole self is coming with you regardless. It's the degree to which you have to hide it that becomes the effort. Mm-hmm. And I think coaching, you have to also coach from that whole self perspective 
and be if, if you have a coach who, who isn't getting a little personal with you, I would probably question that. I would probably question the fit. I'd question the long-term change capability. Short-term, anything can happen, but long-term, eh, not so sure. And I, I like, I really do appreciate your emphasis on fit too, because it is, it's just like any other, you know, important relationship is if it's, if someone's not quite the right fit, it doesn't mean that a coach isn't, isn't, isn't good at coaching or that you're not ready to be coached. Like, I feel like that's another thing too, that some people might turn inward and be like, ah, oh, maybe it's just not for me. It's like, no, 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 no. You just haven't found the right one yet. So just, you know, keep looking, keep engaging. And quite frankly, don't give up. <laughs> if any of you are listening, if, you, if any of you are thinking about it, or maybe you've had an experience that was just okay, just I'm telling you, this can be something. And I, I hate to use this word, but I keep reaching for other words. And they're just, it, it could be magical. It could feel magical, which is only a shorthand for just that thing that you could have in your life that you can't quite see for yourself yet. A coach can help you get there in, in, in leaps and bounds, but also it's the everyday work. You know, it's, it's, I'll stop gushing about it. I'm, I've, I've really fallen in love with just the entire coaching, coaching experience in the last few years myself and have made some of my own pivots that have brought a kind of joy and growth to my own life that is just, you know, once I have these conversations with people like you, Millie, and I get so excited because it's tapping into all the things that have brought me so much joy recently. Well, so, you know, me Kevin, it's so true. And the, you know, the other, the other myth out there that we have to bust together, let's just do myth busting right now I love it. is that coaching is sort of you listening to a coach and you taking advice. That's not what coaching is. Coaching is around somebody who can uncover what's already in you, help you bring it out to the surface, help you leverage it, help you exploit it, help you optimize it. And, and there's a lot of homework and work and pre-work and post-work and work. Coaching is work. It isn't just listening to some person give you gameplay calls and you go out and execute. That ain't the story. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, that just ain't the story. I know that in my practice, I force people to do some thinking and some of it's fun and some of it's uncomfortable. And we have to sort of go back and forth. And sometimes things take a little longer than we expected. And sometimes they don't. But the, the key is insights. The key is how do we get personal insights? And that only comes from one person. That comes from the client. The, the coach is just there to sort of poke a hole in the surface so that it has a place to emerge and bloom and, and blossom. But uh, engaging in a, in a coach, expect expect work expect ooh that's that's a pretty good that's almost like a good little tagline a little branding tagline expect 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 to work or be ready to work you know i could i could talk to you about this all day it's like i just this is just a, a fascinating exploration of coaching both specific to you and also just as a as a valuable as concept but please if you would tell tell me and tell the listeners of course what your what's coming up next for your coaching practice and then where people can find out more about you and like get to know you better and meet you I am working on uh, a, a little bit of an outplacement kind of a program right now. Um, it's in, it's in mid-development right now. I'm doing a beta uh, with a couple of folks at the moment, but I'm, I'm looking at what traditional outplacement services offer and then looking at how to customize it for something that's a little bit more long-term, a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more personalized and, and less just sort of this corporate send off and available at lower levels. Frequently, they're only available at very senior, very executive levels. Uh, I, I'd like to make something available for folks who find themselves uh, out of work and needing to get back into the job market, but I'd like to do it at a more affordable value and, and, and give them a toolbox that they can use for the rest of their career, things that won't go away, things that they can just apply and reapply. So it's a bit of teaching someone to fish when they are looking for a job. And, and that's where that pivoting with, with poise and power comes from and purpose. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Give them some, take care of the short-term needs and the long-term. You know, you yeah. don't have to pick one or the other. And I feel like that's a, 
that's a, that's a, that's a false choice. And I, I like that you're, bust, yeah, and, if you're busting. And Kevin, <laughs> I'll tell you, every year I pick a new word for the year to motivate me. And my new word for 2022 hmm. is and, because I've decided that people just shouldn't have to choose. I think and is a fabulously powerful word. It's short, it's concise, it, 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 it's hard to forget. <laughs> and I think if you live a life of ands, I think mm -hmm. you will get much more. I can't think of a better way to, to, to go out. That's, a, that's the perfect note to go out. Where can people find you? Like your website, are you, what, what social media platforms are you most active on? I am most active on LinkedIn. I'm at Millie Christman with two ends. There's probably only one of me. There's a great marketing guy out in New Jersey by, by the same last name, but he's, he's not me. <laughs> um, my website is www.marathongrowthmanagementmt.com. So that's where people can reach me. I'm on Twitter here and there, but primarily LinkedIn. Okay. Yes. Yeah, same, same for me. I'm, I'm on Twitter mostly just for, just for the laughs. I have a very, a very tightly curated feed there because like most social media, if you're not careful, sometimes things can get a little out of hand. So yeah, but LinkedIn, LinkedIn is always a good place to, to start. Millie? Thank you so much. I'd like I said, I could do this for hours longer, but it is still the holidays. So I will sign us off, at least for now. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Millie, thank you for being here. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Great fun. Thanks, Kevin.